Hello, my name's John Darlington and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here to, well, to, to my wheelhouse. Uh, we're here to uh, launch the, the, my new book for Yale University Press, which is called Amongst the Ruins. And it's all about why civilizations collapse and historic communities disappear. The structure of this launch is, is really simple. Firstly, I'm going to explain a little bit about what motivated me to write this book. Why, why did I want to write it? Secondly, I'm going to touch upon five of the main themes of the book, and we're just going to visit geographically across the world some of the stories which uh, make up the main content of Amongst the Ruins. Then we've got a specially recorded session, which I did earlier in the week with the television presenter and historian Dan Snow, where we mulled and chatted about the importance of learning the lessons from the past. After that, we go to a live Q&A session where it, I will try and answer your questions. So please think about those questions. If you've read the book, you might already have some. But if, as I present, you think about some questions, then please uh, literally post them in, the, in the, the appropriate box below on your screen. And the World Monuments Fund team will, will feed them through to me and I shall try and answer them. So let's turn to that first question. Why did I write this book? My fascination is really to ask the question why, when you look at the red sandstone tombs of uh, Petra, or you look at the, the whole citadel of Machu Picchu or the destroyed citadel of Persepolis, the first question which comes into your mind is, how did it, how did it get there? How did it, how was it created? Who were the people who lived there? What are their stories? And then ultimately, how did they, how did it end as a ruin? What happened to that place to make it the place that we see today? If you type in learn the lessons of the past into your search engine, you will come up with literally hundreds and hundreds of quotations. My favourite, however, is one which says, history repeats itself because nobody was listening the first time. And the book, in a way, is, a, is my own personal and a very selective way of trying to make sure that people do sit up and listen to some of the lessons from this vast library of humanity's experience which stretches way back to the to the Paleolithic. The book is divided into 17 small stories and each of those stories is about the destruction or disappearance of a civilization. And then what I tried to do, or I've tried to do, is to unpick what are the themes which connect those stories? What are the reasons why those places have disappeared or collapsed? And I grouped those into five themes, and they are climate change, and natural hazards, uh, economic collapse, war, and human error. And if we, if we look at those themes, we can see that all of those are entirely relevant today. The things which have happened in the past, as I said before, this vast library, the past is repeating itself. So surely we can learn some of the lessons in these historical stories to help us in future stories and current stories. That's the purpose of the book. So let's begin our journey then. And we'll, we'll start with the theme of climate change and we'll move from here on the barge on the Thames in London, we'll move a relatively short distance across England, across Essex, across to the coast of Suffolk, where we come to the village of Dunwich. Now, the reason I picked Dunwich is because it is in many ways England's shingle-laden Atlantis. This small village of under 200 people was once one of the, the largest settlements in the whole of England. Dunwich was an important place, important enough to be listed in the Doomsday Book of 1086, when it was in amongst the top 20 towns across the whole of England. By the time it came to 1573, uh, someone called John Snow was writing about Dunwich, and he says that there were 70 parish churches, houses of religion, hospitals and chapels. I have to confess that 70 must be an exaggeration, but we know for sure that there were eight different parishes, each with their own parish churches, and a large number of religious institutions, whether it's Dominican Priories, Knights Templars, Franciscan Friaries, or the Grey Friars. It was affluent, and its affluence derived from the religious institutions, from the trading centre, which uh, was at its heart, from the interest in the crown, and 
it had all the accoutrements you'd expect of a wealthy place. It had a mint, it had a town hall, it had a guild hall, it had a central marketplace, it had 47 shops, even in its decline. So it was, it was a thriving, buzzing place. Most of its, its economy was driven by the fishing industry, particularly an inshore fishing fleet, which uh, every year would, would bring in a, a massive haul of herrings, which would then be treated and processed in the town and then sent across England and further abroad. But in many ways, Dunwich is doomed. And the reason for its demise is because of two things. Firstly, climate change. A rising sea level combined with increased storminess, which has been taking place not over decades, but centuries, has slowly eaten away at the fringes of the town, then the core of the town, then the, the heart of the town itself. And secondly, the same processes uh, have been involved in a, a strong literal current whereby sands and gravels are washed up the coast, washing away in a similar way the, 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 the town of Dunwich. The loss is particularly poignant because if you look at the early maps of Dunwich that you can and do historical map analysis, you actually work out that the original eastern eastern boundary of the city, of the town, which was defended by a town wall, that eastern boundary was 1.2 kilometres further to the east than the current shoreline. So we've lost 1.2 kilometres of Dunwich's streets its houses, its buildings, its economy, its, its life. Eventually, all the seaward parishes suffered in a similar way, and the events prompted the Greyfriars to relocate. And the only ruins which survive today are the relocated ruins of Greyfriars. So climate change is a major factor in the loss of civilizations, as witnessed by places like Dunwich. I'll leave the last word on this story, though, to Daniel Defoe, who saw Dunwich as a, as a memento mori, really, a reminder not only of the temporal existence of humanity, but also of our cultural legacy. He says, by numerous examples, we may see that towns and cities die as well as we. My second theme is about natural hazard, earthquakes and volcanoes and the like. So we transport from one coastal Atlantis to another and we go from Dunwich on the Suffolk coast to Port Royal in Jamaica. The English invaded Jamaica, taking it from the Spanish and the indigenous population in 1655 and they created on the southern part of the island a port, Port Royal. The port is constructed on the end of a very long, 10 kilometres long spit of land and it balances on the, the stony end of that, that spit of land. And this becomes one of the major ports of the Caribbean. Port Royal is a thriving capital which numbers something like six and a half thousand people and its wealth is based upon its geographical position right in the middle of a crossroads of trade in the Caribbean. It's become the home of the, the buccaneer and pirate community who were invited there as the brethren of the coast by the English authorities to disrupt the, the, the trade with Spain. And they take their cut from that, that, that arrangement. So it's a, a thriving pirate capital, buccaneer capital. Its wealth also derives because it's a tax haven. It's a place where the English select to undercut their rivals, the Spanish, by trading to the Spanish main, so that's the, the American colonies of Spain, and not charging the taxes which the Spanish imposed by that. So they undercut the slower, heavier Spanish fleets uh, and, and trade thrives in this place. So you've got a, a buzzing port capital. This was a, a town, a city like no other. It, it had more running cash than London. Its houses looked like London houses. They didn't look like Caribbean houses. This was a place of extreme wealth, extreme debauchery, extreme religion. It was a place of extremes. And then in 1692, disaster strikes. If we go to the diary of the Reverend Manuel Heath, who's the rector of Port Royal, He's sitting down with his friend, John White, who's the acting governor general of Jamaica. And Heath was, was naturally alarmed 
when the ground, and this, these are his words, began rolling and moving under my feet, upon which I said, Lord, sir, what's this? He, White, his companion, replied very composedly, being a very grave man, it's an earthquake, be not afraid, it will soon be over. But it increased, and we heard the church and the tower fall, upon which we ran to save our lives. It was a complete disaster. It's estimated that between 1,500 and 2,300 people died during the event, uh, and some 2,000 more died after the event when polluted water and disease were rife. In many ways, this was inevitable. Jamaica sits upon two tectonic plates, or the junction of two tectonic plates, and the combination of designing this and, and creating this, this mini Manhattan uh, on the end of this spit of land and designing buildings on it, which are in the, the English and European style, so they're not built for earthquakes, made the, the, the catastrophe almost inevitable. But what continues to fascinate historians is the earthquake freezes Port Royal's early history in a moment in time. It's a unique place, less than 40 years old, that was already 40 years ahead of its time because of this cash-based economy. On one hand, though, Port Royal was, and I quote, the fairest town of all the English plantations, the best emporium and mart of this part of the world, exceeding in its riches, plentiful of all good things. Whilst on the other hand, Jamaica and all within it was the dunghill of the universe, the refuse of the whole creation, the receptacle, receptacle of vagabonds, the sanctuary of bankrupts, and a close stool for the purges of our prisons, as sickly as a hospital, as dangerous as the plague, as hot as hell and as wicked as the devil. This then is the story of how natural hazards lead to the collapse of civilizations. My next story takes us from the Caribbean to Iraq, to northern Iraq, uh, where we're in the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Assyrian Empire, a place called Nimrud. Located just above the junction of the, the, the mighty Tigris and one of its, its major tributaries, Nimrud was already a 300-year-old city by the time the Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal II made it his capital at the expense of Assur, uh, 80 kilometres away. The city is, is really his biography. Most of what we know about Ashurnasirpal comes from Nimrud's remarkable collection of inscriptions and carved reliefs that recorded and amplified his achievements. He's quoted as saying, in my wisdom, I came to Kalu, i.e. Nimrud, and cleared away the old hill of debris. I dug down to the water level, I built up a terrace, and upon it that I erected my royal throne, and for my own enjoyment I, be I built eight beautiful halls. I painted on the walls of palaces in bright blue paint. I had lapis lazuli coloured glazed bricks made and set them above the gates. So this is a magnificent capital of a, uh, a huge and important empire and they represent, they personify the emperor himself. The association with the city and the king uh, is, is, is overwhelmingly important. The first true loss of Nimrud, and there are actually not one, but three losses of this place due to war, were part of the tumultuous events which marked the end of empire. And essentially the, the Neo-Assyrian Empire comes to an end with uh, being conquered by its neighbours, who are the Babylonians from the south and west and the Medes from the north and east. Nineveh falls in 612 BCE, and the other cities, including Nimrud, uh, fall in quick succession after that. And then what we see is that the Babylonians and Medes impose their, their own will. They, they impose their own state upon the kingship of the Neo-Assyrians. And they do that by physically smashing uh, the palaces. They do it by destroying the cultural identity of the king, the ruler that they have they have deposed. 
So it's ritual smashing of temples and the, Syri the symbols of the neo-Assyrian regime. In particular, there's a, a piece of, uh, as an example, a piece of ultra-violence where carvings of Ashurnasirpal and his successors are rendered blind and mute and broken. So the, the carved reliefs which once, once lined the palaces of Nimrud are literally struck through, eyes are blinded. And in one particularly macabre illustration, a new genie is actually scribed into uh, the an old carving, staring directly at the broken uh, representation of the, the the broken king. So it's absolutely about superimposing your power through destroying the power and the magic of your predecessor. The final loss of Nimrud comes in really a strange echo of the the, the Babylonian conquest, in that the fundamentalist group Islamic State. Uh, after declaring their new Islamic caliphate in northern Iraq and Syria, so just, just this area, began to move to take territories around Mosul. And during that, that period, so 2014 onwards, there was obviously a brutal cleansing of people, of people who uh, did not agree with the, the, the religious fundamentalist view of the world as interpreted by ISIS. Videos soon circulated of ISIS terrorists destroying statuary in Mosul Museum and labelling them idolatrous. And in February 2015, they moved on to Nimrud. Their, their first target were the gates of Asher Nazpal's Northwest Palace, which they used sledgehammers and electric drills to deface. Uh, to remove the reliefs and the Lamassu, which they subsequently piled in fractured mounds outside the gate. A little later in April, they returned and used barrels of ammonium nitrate to wreak further havoc on the palace structure. Um, wherever they found carved reliefs, they were smashed and destroyed. ISIS returned once more in 2016, and this time they they completely bulldozed the, the great ziggurat, this 3,000 year old structure, bulldozed it flat and pushed it into the river course. Unfortunately for Isis, the ziggurat contained no hidden chambers full of riches and unfortunately for humanity, the world lost a symbol of one of the greatest ancient civilizations. Our fourth theme is to do with economic collapse and for here we move from Iraq all the way across to the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, to a place called Humberstone. The Atacama Desert in northern Chile is one of the most inhospitable places in the world. By day, the temperature is 30 degrees. By night, it's two, uh, and rainfall is technically at zero. But what the Atacama does have, particularly in the Tarapaca region, is natural deposits of sodium nitrate, or otherwise known as saltpeter. This has a value to make gunpowder, particularly in the, the 18th and 19th century, but it's not the most efficient use of saltpeter. That comes with the discovery that saltpeter is a natural fertilizer for crops. And if you think about this period, this period is a period of industrial growth, particularly in Northern Europe and in America. And the populations which fuel that industrial revolution require feeding. So there's a similar revolution in agriculture where the guarantee of, of food, the guarantee of crop growth becomes increasingly important. From this humble beginning of a, a, a small industry in the Tarapaca region of the Atacama Desert, that, that small industry suddenly develops an, a national, if not international significance as this realization that saltpeter is, is a fabulous fertilizer grows. One of the many places which is important for the extraction and processing of saltpeter is a place called Humberstone Mine, which was established in 1862 alongside Santa Clara, which is its neighbor. And this place is a, a huge industrial complex in the desert comprising silos and crushers and conveyor belts and leaching plants and chimneys and drying yards and an enormous tailings mound 
And the town is big. The town is 10 by 6 blocks with a central square, with houses made of Douglas fir, with zinc corrugated roofs, uh, stuccoed walls, and the, the various different facilities from theatres to to sporting facilities, a swimming pool, uh, a basketball, tennis, swimming, chapel, cinema, uh, all these things are general stores. This is a this is a, a a a busy town in the desert. The importance of places like Humberstone and indeed the saltpeter industry to Chile cannot be understated. In 1840, the Tarapaca area was producing approximately 73,000 tonnes of saltpetre a year. By 1870, so just 30 years later, that had increased to 500,000 tonnes. Saltpetre is wrapped up with many other stories of national importance to Chile and indeed nation-building importance. Uh, the, the value of saltpetre to Peru and to Bolivia, as well as to Chile, sparked what's known as the, in some circles, as the saltpetre wars, which actually shaped the boundaries of Peru and Chile and, and led to the loss of Bolivia's uh, coastal boundary. Uh, the, the social movements uh, of the development of unions in Chile are also inextricably linked to the saltpetre industry. By 1890, 50% of the country's total revenue came from the duty on saltpetre, and it remained at that level for three decades. If you go to Humberstone today, it is an abandoned place. So what happened? War in Europe forced the Germans to, to look elsewhere for saltpetre. The result of that was that the scientific community in Germany worked on the development of uh, synthetic nitrate, uh, which was made from ammonia. This was developed by Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch uh, from 1913. And that production of synthetic fertiliser meant that the saltpetre simply wasn't needed and that the figures are startling. We go from Chile accounting for 80% of global nitrate production in the 1880s to just 15% by 1950 and by 1990 it was it was less than 1%. The result was that the the industry collapses it implodes. Humberstone closed down in 1958 and Santa Maria in 1960. The impact of this economic collapse on the Chilean economy uh, was also writ large. The country was the most affected by the Great Depression of 1929 and 1932. So here we have a story about economic collapse, but it's rooted in the fact that uh, on a reliance on a, a single product, on the, the, the creation of saltpetre, and once demand disappears or technology moves on, then that leaves that whole community the communities of Santa Barbara and the community of Humberstone to be incredibly vulnerable and eventually to disappearing. For my final theme, we move from Chile to Chile, but this time we go from uh, mainland Chile to Rapa Nui or Easter Island, uh, and that's no mean distance, essentially 3,700 kilometres away from the Chilean coast. So a huge distance, one of the most remote populated islands in the world. And the theme that we pick up at Rapa Nui is of uh, human error, human disaster, if you like. When we think of Easter Island, we, we typically think of those monumental Moai heads. Uh, there are 900 which uh, dot the island. The Moai heads are the emblem of Rapa Nui and the, the book covers the people who made them, their development, what happens to them. But the 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 thing that I'm most interested to to discover is how did we reach a population which started certainly in the region of three to four, five thousand people in the 16th century, how did that decline to just 111 in 1876, what happened to make that population disappear? The arrival of Europeans and Americans 
in the 18th century and 19th century brings a number of things which lead directly to the decimation of the Rapa Nui population. The first is that they exposed for the first time to diseases which they've never been exposed to before. So whether it be uh, TB or syphilis or smallpox and these diseases rip through the population decimating them. The second major impact upon the Rapa Nui population is the arrival of slavers. Uh, initially these were whalers and sealers who wanted crew for their ships but the real disaster strikes in 1862 when slavers from Peru sought workers for their, their guano mines and the sugar industry in Peru. Between 1862 and 1863 18 ships arrived at Rapa Nui, some to capture slaves, some to stop off and restore. To give you some idea of numbers, over 1,300 Rapa Nui arrived on the Peruvian coast, including the king, his priests and his son. And once they were there, they were exposed to the same diseases which had been so devastating earlier in the century, particularly smallpox. Some eventually were sent back to Rapa Nui, but they were sent back with those diseases. And once more, uh, those wreaked havoc on the population. And to make matters worse, uh, in 1868, large tracts of the Rapa Nui interior are given over to sheep farming and the, that, those Rapa Nui who remain are essentially quarantined and almost imprisoned in a, in a camp uh, on one small corner of the island whilst the rest of the island is given over to sheep. So it's a, it's a tragic story of the impact of humankind. Fortunately, the population has recovered and of the 5,000 people who live on the island, 3,000 are actually Rapa Nui. So if anything, the Rapa Nui story is about the resilience of humankind as much as it is about humankind's inhumanity to one another. First glance, the stories that I include in this book are ultimately incredibly depressing because they're the stories of collapse. There for the grace of God go I, you might say. But actually the whole purpose of the book, the whole theme, the whole thesis is that if you look back at the past, if you look back at some of these great calamities which are intervened with huge triumphs, if you look back at that and think of it as this incredible library of things that humans have done before and things that we can learn from, then that gives us an extremely valuable asset for us to think about how we head into the future. And this is a question which I then pose to Dan Snow. It's a real pleasure to have you in, in my wheelhouse, which well, is... I'm in your wheelhouse, metaphorically and physically. Uh, this is so cool. It's some reminds, it's, I, I recognise some of the old navigational equipment from my dad's boat back in the 80s and even the 70s, so I think you've, you, kept the, you kept the heritage going there very effectively. But it's gorgeous, isn't it? This is the way to live in London, on it, the Thames. Totally. I mean, it's, it, it, there's so much pleasure I get from this place. Oh. One of the things I wanted to start by asking you is is really about why what started it off this I this fascination for history and your career. What what made you what started you off in this world? Well, I, I for me it's very simple. It was with my mother's milk. I have a family full of insanely um, enthusiastic people about history. My the no, number one is my auntie Margaret Millen, who's a professor of history. Um, but my grandma loved it. Everyone loves history. Everyone loves storytelling. A lot of a lot of people, journalists in the family, which is actually just. You know, sort of historians really, because what they're doing is they're trying to analyse what has happened in in their case over a more short period of time, um, and then explain that to the public. So that is uh, that's all we did in our family. It came as a terrible shock to me <laughs> when I went to school and stuff found out there were other subjects that you had to master, like French and sciences and maths and everything else. So that was my case, uh, and also we used to travel like travel. Uh, uh, the point of travel for us was to go and visit historical sites like that, and, and I, I've never lost that. Like I. I love travel, of course, but I can, it can be a bit aimless, um, and particularly in the digital age, you can sort of just find yourself sort of floating around a city and just sort of, uh, and for me, just have that spine, that interest to take you somewhere to go and look at something from our past, from our shared heritage is, um, 
is very important. What about you? Is that, that the same for you? Similar yeah, journey? Yeah, exactly the same. As in, you know, it's it's in the blood. It's it started for me. I was I claim that I was born in in Benghazi in in Libya, and I claim that my mother pushed me. Well, she did push me around the ruins of Leptis Magna in in a pram. But of course, it's a false claim, really, because we left age six months. So, but the reality is, the irony is that we moved to close to Windsor Great Park, and if you go to Virginia Water, close to Windsor Great Park, someone in the 19th century, and I forget who it is, they actually removed some of the remains of Leptis Magna and placed them on the side of the Virginia Park Lake. So, I've got this this kind of memory, which is completely fake, of Leptis Magna, but it's in this rather uh, odd and probably contentious site at Virginia Water. That's so strange, isn't it? Isn't I it weird? That. That's so, so, but essentially, archaeology has been kind of in my in my blood from from dot. And you know, when you're a child, you have those arguments about superpowers, and your friends would want to to fly or to have X-ray vision or super bendy arms or whatever it might be. My superpower was absolutely time travel. That's what I wanted oh, to do. Totally. Yeah. Uh, anyone who says anything different is crazy, um, and and as you've you know, turned it into a career, um, and you, so for, as well as being enjoyable and good for us and um, exciting aesthetically, you feel it's important as well because it's hard for us, isn't it, to make the case in a world of a world of you know pressing concerns and 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 um, calls on our time and money. It's hard to make the case for, for history and heritage, isn't it? But that's what you do. Yeah, entirely, and I think for me. There's there's the natural curiosity, so things which probably you and I were drawn in at the very beginning. So why does why does Petra look like Petra looks? What what happened there? So the time travel element. But for me, that's that's only one part of it. There's the, that's the casting back look. The bit which is important to me, or as important, is the way in which the you know, everything in the past has kind of happened before. It's this enormous enormous library of events, of catastrophes, of successes, of, of failures. And so for me there's something really interesting about how you, you learn the lessons of the past and then you, you, you use that to actually help guide you in the future. And I think that for me, so the past is not just a, a backwards look, it's very much something which dictates where we've come from, who we are and where we're going in the future. Yeah, how about you? all those stories that I know in the archaeologists, they're, they're then they don't just want to gossip about dead people. <laughs> they're all interested in the future. You know, they're, they're all passionate about what's what's happening and where is it going. And because the past is the only playbook we've got, you've got to start in the past, right? But yeah. it's not that we're all weird and we're just obsessed with, you know, fabric manufacture in Middle Kingdom Egypt. <laughs> we, we are intensely fascinated by humans and, and where this mad journey ends. Yes, I totally agree. I totally agree. And so, presuming the same thing applies for you in terms of the, the importance of the past is, is yeah. in that. Yeah, I mean, because, because I grew up in this family of journalists, for me, history is always a tool. Like, they, for them, it's a very practical tool. They're like, right, well, someone's just blown something up in the Middle East, or there's been a, a riot in the UK for, from striking coal miners. Let's work out why that's happened. So, let's, let's call on history. It's not like it was not a kind of, you know, it wasn't just reading before bedtime. This was a tool that you had to call on to let you do your job. Yeah. You couldn't explain anything that was going on. You couldn't explain, you know, the, the Cold War that they, we were living through in the eighties. You couldn't explain any of that stuff without without looking back at the past. So it was a really practical tool in our yeah. family. It was never something sort of for for sort of elite contemplation or, or, or sort of hoity toity. It was always like absolutely roll your sleeves up and quickly find out if Kuwait used to be a province of Iraq, like Saddam Hussein claims it was, because he just invaded. You know, that was that's what history was for me. And I've so I've never lost that sense. So following on from that, history hit is kind of enormously popular, growing in popularity. And do you think why do you think people are finding such Resonance well, with that. Well, I think like everywhere on the internet, the internet has enabled good and bad. It's 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 given us a revival of sort of neo Nazis and mad mad <laughs> people, but it's also allowed groups of super fans to come together and find content that that, that appeals to them in a way that they don't get if they just watch uh, you know mainstream TV channel. They might get where, where someone. I mean, I've, on the Today program this morning, Britain's flagship current affairs program on the radio. Uh, there was a discussion about a historical topic that lasted three minutes. It was quite interesting, but they have other things. They talk about dogs on leads worrying sheep and other, you know it's a general interest radio show for a big wide audience 
Well, actually, for lots of us, we'd rather have the half an hour on a, on a particular historical or archaeological subject. And so I'm just one of many people who is, is has sort of tried to deliver um, content in, in that way, using these new platforms and making documentaries and or social video and audio and all that kind of stuff. So it just the, his, the, the history is... Uh, there's a, there was a perception, I think, really unfairly, I don't know why, that history is a kind of niche and quite boring, weird people, oh, it's the thing you, your father-in-law kind of rumbles on about occasionally. History is massive, history is massive among young people, it's a huge degree subject at university, it's a huge choice subject here in, in, um, in secondary education in the UK. Uh, millions of people choose it every year, uh, people love gaming, they love the movies that are sort of history adjacent. Um, history is huge, and, and more people go to historical sites in the UK every weekend than go to football matches. So, yeah. so like there's there's always been a huge passion for history out there, and, and I don't sort of recognise the the assertion that it's just always been a sort of strange niche little hobby. So uh, that's history. That's what I'm up to. What about you? You've just written a great book amongst the ruins. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, so it's a, a really this is about kind of my journey as an archaeologist, really, and my fascination with ruins. And that idea that actually you can learn the lessons from the past. And you, you, you type into Google lessons from the past or, or, or something similar and you'll get, you'll get thousands and thousands of quotations. And yeah, I've got, well, I've got one or two here, so yeah, just, just, to, just to give you right? a good quote. So you've got at one end of the spectrum, you've got people like Lord Byron who says the best of prophets of the future is the past. So again, Great. that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Confucius, study the past if you would divine the future. So all these ideas of looking backwards to tell you about the present and the future. And then, then rather topically for, for us in this particular location, you've got uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge who says, if men could learn from history what lessons it might teach us, but passion and party blind our eyes and the light which experience gives us is a lantern on the stern which shines only on the waves behind. Ah, so again, very very feels appropriate here. So, my, my, But my favourite quote is that history repeats itself because no one was listening the first time. Right. So okay. in a way, this, this book tries to, to pick out some of those lessons of history and I, I theme it along the idea of 17 different stories and each of those stories is is written around a place which has collapsed, fallen apart, disintegrated, disappeared at different scales. So it, I go from uh, whole civilizations in Sumeria all the way up to a single building and what that represents in terms of a community. I use different periods of time, so I go from the ancient Sumerians all the way through to the you know, 20th century Route 66 in America, and I go geographically from Rapa Nui in the Pacific all the way through to the Temple of Confucius in, uh, in China. So it's got this real variety to it. And what I've done is trying to pick out what are the themes, what are the reasons why those places have disappeared or, or collapsed. And I group them into climate change, uh, war, uh, human error, hazard, natural hazard and economic collapse. And these are the reasons why these places disappear. And the, the point for me is that all of those themes are entirely relevant today. You, you just need to look at earthquakes yeah. uh, and the tragedy of, of what's happened in, in southern uh, Turkey and, and Syria. Uh, and you know, the same thing has repeated itself time and time again. So the idea is you take those stories, you look back and you explore why those, those civilizations grew and then disappeared. And then you think really deeply about, well, what does that mean for us today? What are, what are the lessons that we can learn? I guess, you know, when I started your book, I was thinking, can, we, can, we, can he really tell us? Are there hard and fast lessons? Can we avoid this cycle, this, this um, never-ending cycle? Well, we don't know if it's ended, but this seemingly never-ending cycle of, of, bu of building, construction and destruction. Okay, you know, do you, are there answers there? I think, I think there are. So what I try and do is I try and tackle it at two different levels. I try and tackle it at a level which says... Actually, you know, if the example, a practical level. So, if you took uh, a civilization in the North Africa or the or the Near or Middle East, and you look at how they design their buildings, or, or you take any place actually, and you look at the indigenous architecture, which might be built to withstand the cold or extreme heat or flooding or earthquake, and you take those lessons, which we're kind of 
sort of rather uh, immune to or, or divorced from because in our lives we, we seem to think that we can control nature. We have triple glazing air conditioning, we can control the smells and sounds in our rooms. But actually, if you look back at these examples from the past, you can, you know, th the example would be uh, take a, a, a building in, in North Africa which might have you know, thick walls to retain the heat uh, or to deflect the heat, to absorb it. You might have a courtyard in the middle of the building which again keeps cold air in. You'd have uh, a, a wonderful projecting window or windows called mashrabia windows which stick out normally on the, the, the cooler side of the building and capture the wind. And as they capture the wind, which passes over these vessels of water which sit inside the window, and it cools the whole building. These are really practical ways in which people in the past have dealt without air conditioning. It's such an exciting time, isn't it? Because we, we, in the 20th century, it felt like we just were like teenagers. We discovered all this new stuff, and we just tore away and just had no interest in what came before. And now it seems that people like you and many scientists were relearning that nature had a very, or, or traditional knowledge and or nature had a very clever way of doing things. And we're now kind of marrying those two traditions together, aren't we? So it's an exciting time. I think really exciting and it and needn't be, we're not slaves to the past. So, you know, obviously technology moves on, things move on, but just to take some of those ideas and apply modern technology to those ideas, that, that again, you're still taking the, the lessons from the past, but in a constructive, in a constructive way. Brilliant. So, you are confident that we can learn these lessons. Uh, it's an optimistic. <laughs> it's an op yes. It, the, the, the subject of the book is, at first glance, quite depressing: the collapse of civilizations. But the end of the book is that you know, this is essentially you've got literally thousands and thousands of years of of examples of where humans have, as I say, failed or succeeded. Let's take some of those lessons and let's let's apply them practically as well as philosophically. I love it. I love it. T tell me about one place where you, you, you know where you feel all those things come together of all the places you've you talked right about and studied. So, well, I, I think I mean I I won't pick one. I'll pick seventeen. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to point you exactly back to the book because I think that that is the point of the book is that I've I've curated this very personal collection. So it's it's there, there won't be all the usual candidates in there, but I've curated a personal collection of where. Uh, civilizations or historic communities have disappeared and really tried to drill down into the why, the complications and what we might learn from it. How about you though? What, 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 well I think, I think I uh, loved, and you talk about, well you talked about so many places, but I, I love uh, the Greenland sites, the Norse uh, Viking sites in Greenland. Very interesting, Europeans moving into a new continent, a uh, very different landscape, different uh, natural, a different natural order, if you like, uh, assuming that they can overcome that with kind of lots of European technology, fighting an interesting but ultimately d losing battle against that climate, that landscape, uh, and the ruins they left behind, a place to think about kind of our hubris uh, hubristic attempts to colonise, to, you know, and, and, I, don't, and I don't just mean colonise new, whole new um uh, areas of the globe, but I just mean colonising a you know a field, a, a fjord, a bay, um, and you know them struggling with, with fresh water and with the cold and with how to keep the animals. And you can see this, all the innovations they're making, and ultimately they lost, and they lost in part because of climate change, um, but and in part we think because of their refusal to learn from the Inuits who were there, who were surviving there. And, and there are certain, th like, what is it in our culture that actually we can't live with, we just can't, we'd rather not adapt so much that we lose kind of an essential piece of our own culture, whether it's in our diet, our family relations, our, our living, you know, we just want to live in one place. Or, you know, we don't want to take up a, a seasonal kind of migratory lifestyle. Um, and so I think that's a place where you think about us as a species and and then in the future, like what sacrifices are we going to have to make, or what technology are we going to have to, or what we have to embrace in order to overcome the new world in which we find ourselves living? So, I find that's a really a powerful place, a haunting place. Yeah, great example. I think I think for me, that one of the things as an archaeologist and you as a historian, really, I think if you look back at at all that kind of decades, centuries, millennia of history, that the, the only thing that we can guarantee is that everything changes. Yeah, that's the most. Uh, yeah. And so for me, that that's kind of the fundamental thing: is how do you deal with that philosophically? And I think, as an archaeologist, the 
my approach is around conservation and that simply described many people think of archaeologists as people who preserve things you know stop the tide of time pickle things in aspic but I think we're the complete opposite we are and I guess historians in a sense are the same is that it's all about how do you what is the careful management of change? And that, yeah. that, I think, sits at the heart of our philosophy. Yeah, it's, a bit, it's weird for me, because I grew up in the... I sort of came of age in the 1990s, and as Napoleon said, if you want to understand anyone, think about how the world looked when they were 21. And see, when I was 21, it did look like everything had stopped. You know, people like Tony Blair and George Bush were in power, and they were saying... They were literally saying things like, well, history has never mattered less than it matters now, because yeah. we are living in a post-Cold War world, pre-9-11 world... Uh, we are living in a uh, where China is sort of taking baby steps towards regularizing its relationships with the West. Russia was still a democracy of sorts. India was de- democratizing fast. It just looked like it was all sorts. You know, the whole world yeah. was basically. So my whole adult life has been a, one giant sort of instinctual confusion about the world because actually older currents have reemerged, which is that things are ever changing and power and ebbs and flows and economic might and systems and ideas and I never believed we'd see a kind of rise of, of illiberal nationalism like we've seen in, in, in the last few years in, in, uh, in our world. So uh, it, the, I, le- I forgot one of the key lessons from history when I was 21 which is as you said uh, everything changes the present is neither it was and it, the present's not inevitable that's the other thing so not everything wasn't just going to lead up to this point it could have gone many many different ways so the present's not inevitable and it's not immutable it's going to change and uh, those are the things that i've i've really learned particularly going around sites and looking at these especially ancient egypt the proudest sites you think these pharaohs thought they had it made <laughs> and now there's sheep grazing amongst the ruins of those fine buildings and the you know and, and the nile has reclaimed so much of it through flooding and and not and then Bits that, of course, have been nicked by um, by passers through. So, yeah, it is um, when you love history, archaeology. It, it, again, it's it just it, you're, you're thinking about your world. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a brilliant place in which to end it. So, Dan, thank you so much. That was really appreciated you coming and, and joining me in the wheelhouse. Thank Thanks you very much. Well done for a great book. Go and buy it, everybody. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, it's uh, we've got a, a short amount of time to do a Q and A. And firstly, thing thing to say is good to see so many people from across the world, people from Zambia, all over the United States, uh, from Pakistan, from Australia, from from Wales, Switzerland. So it's lovely to 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 know that you're all out there. And some really good questions. So I'll try and I'll try and answer a few of those in the time remaining. Uh, Scott asked the question. Uh, is there uh, a single reason for collapse? It, do, do those singular reasons for collapse happen? And my research during the book has come up with the kind of conclusion that actually collapse is rarely singular. So all of those examples that I give around climate change, around human error, around war, often one builds upon another. Uh, so, so I use those as the starting motif for uh, why civilizations and historic communities collapse, but often they build and they aggregate and they exacerbate one another. Uh, that happens very uh, frequently. Uh, some, some good challenging questions in there as well. Uh, Nick asks about uh, the, uh, do we relocate places like uh, the Greyfriars? in Dunwich. Uh, my answer to that is that it's already been relocated once uh, and at some stage that the sea will get it. It's just a case of when. Uh, so my my answer is that actually sometimes we are going to have to let go. I, I think that's that's becoming increasingly evident. It's just a case of how do we let go and over what time period. And for that, I think we need to ask the local community and think about how they fit in with this mix. It's worth saying that if the Greyfriars uh, uh, church goes at Dunwich, the one that you saw at the, the beginning of that story, if that goes, there's an awful lot that's also going to go at the same time, including communities in which people are currently living. So good challenging question. Thank you for that one. Uh, Fernanda asks the question, uh, does uh, what's World Monuments Fund role in this? I'm glad you asked that, Fernanda. Uh, 
we've put a link into the chat so you can link into World Monuments Fund and get a, an idea of what we do. But in terms of World Monuments Fund and my writing of this book, the answer is yes, it's been very much part of it. Uh, five of the sites that I talk about in the book uh, including places like Route 66, which I didn't talk about during this event, and Herschel Island on the, the Arctic coast, Ani in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, they are all sites which World Monuments Fund has helped to conserve, has worked with the local community to try and understand and to make sure some of those stories are, 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 are learnt, some of those stories about the lessons from the past. So we're very much heavily involved there, and I have to say that uh, Jonathan Bell, who's the uh, one of the key people at World Monuments Fund, he was my peer reviewer for this book, a thankless task. So yes, World Monuments Fund, very much, very much involved in this. Uh, Alex, I'm, I'm racing through these, but Alex asks the question about, uh, are there other practical examples about uh, uh, that we can use to, where people have all practical examples from the past that we could use today? And I find this a fascinating topic because, uh, as I said during the, the presentation, we literally have thousands and thousands of years of human invention, human uh, uh, genius and human disaster. So we all know that the best way to learn or the best way to improve is to learn from your mistakes. Well, we've got this, this massive back of catalog of mistakes and successes. So we should be learning from that. And in terms of Alex's question, uh, we, you know, we've, we've seen the, the recent tragedy of the earthquake, which happened in February in Turkey and Northern Syria. And uh, yet there are there are historic ways as well as new ways of earthquake proofing buildings. Uh, and the example I use is to go to Japan, which is one of the most earthquake countries in the entire world. And you look at the the, the Toji Pagoda, which was constructed well last last reconstructed in the mid 17th century. It's in Kyoto. And that whole pagoda, which is the tallest in Japan, tallest traditional pagoda in Japan, the, Japan, the whole pagoda is built off a single column, which is called the Shinbashira column. And it literally hangs, the whole structure hangs from that column. So when the earthquake occurs, the, the whole building can maneuver and can shake, it can, and, it, and it survives. And there are, there are countless other technologies out there like that, historic technologies, which we can and should be using uh, to, in the present day. The same themed question has come up from uh, Emran Khan as well, who, who talks about the Indus Valley civilization, which is obviously thousands and thousands of years old and was a very sophisticated civilization. Uh, and I, I, I point back to that same answer. Yes, there are. It doesn't matter how old those civilizations are. There are still things that we can learn from it. Uh, so particularly around traditional architecture in a time when we were much closer to nature because we didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have triple quadrupled glazing. We didn't have those things. So there's something about not necessarily going back to nature, but just relearning uh, those those traditional technologies and applying them in, in an entirely modern way. But we should be relearning them. Uh, another question, another challenging one. Uh, this one from Norma, actually, who who asks about the role of England and colonization during the the, the Pacific War, which is the war in uh, between Chile and Peru and uh, Bolivia uh, in 1879. And the question is a good one because uh, the, the border uh, after independence between Peru and uh, Chile is set on the 24th parallel. Uh, but Peru gives Chile uh, literally uh, uh, between the 23rd and 25th parallel the uh, 25 year lease effectively to, to uh, manage uh, the mining of saltpeter and the processing of saltpeter. And the, um, they, the, the Peruvians agree to this. I'm sure there are many other specialists out there who, who can give you much more detail, but essentially in a very simplistic version, the Peruvians agree to this, uh, but because of the huge, huge investment of um, British companies, that that zone becomes incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, 
uh, popular and uh, produces huge revenues for the Chilean companies and indeed the British companies who work there. So yes, there's a very direct link between, well, an indirect but direct link between the UK and the the the, uh, the Pacific War. And indeed, there's actually an even more direct link uh, during the Civil War of 1891. But we haven't got time to go into that there. Uh, the other questions I've got, forgive me, time is time is cracking on. Uh, we've got from Andrew uh, and ask a question about is there a a what's the difference between my book and or are there things that I agree or disagree with the book Collapse written by Jared Diamond? Uh, again, good question. And the answer to that is, uh, yeah, I, I certainly disagree with him on certain subjects. And the one that I fundamentally disagree with him on is is the one that we've covered as, as the last story that I told there about Rapa Nui because he sees he sees the decimation and the collapse of the Rapa Nui population as something that happens primarily before the the European uh, the Europeans arrive. So he sees a population of something like seventeen and a half thousand people collapsing to three and a half thousand people. Uh, caused by ecocide, so caused essentially by the, the indigenous population cutting down the trees and effectively uh, disrupting, destroying the soil of the island and therefore their ability to live on it. So he sees that collapse as a, as a much earlier thing. Uh, I don't think there's particularly evidence for that. There's evidence for a slow, uh, a slow disappearance of the woodland cover, but not this huge, huge collapse, which he, he points out. Uh, I'm just having a, a quick look to see if there are any other questions. Uh, I think we are we are probably running out of time actually, and I've covered I've covered all the ones that I can within the time. So uh, it just remains really for me to say that uh, if we're going to we've recorded this session, so you'll be able to to, to revisit it afterwards, and you'll see when you see the the, the if you revisit it. Uh, we're just about to flash up a promotion code. So if you'd like to buy uh, the book, then you can buy that book for 30% off. Uh, if you're a US cu customer, then please go through the US site uh, and put in the code that you can see there. If you're a, a European or UK customer, then please go through the UK site and put in that different code. And the UK site also uh, offers uh, a reduction on fake heritage, which is my previous book. So, so please go out to purchase that book. I hope you enjoy it. And we will we will follow up with an email. So if you didn't catch the details, that you can catch it later on. And I think uh, at that moment in time, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for attending. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I very much hope you enjoyed the book. And I'll remind you once more that my 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 final quotation is that uh, that uh, history repeats itself because uh, we forget the lessons of the past. So this book is a small contribution towards acting people to prompt up and sit up and look at the lessons from the past. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, morning, wherever you are.